Chapter 16 The Agrobiologist So, what's the crisis here? Derek asked. And that screwy message of yours, that bit about my internal engineering? What's that all about? They were standing in the control room of the Zeroborodiz, where they had gone to get away from the others. Silverside walked in, sat down in one of the deep cushioned passenger seats behind the pilot's upholstered bucket, and listened to Ariel and Derek. "'Some engineering I figured out, quite without your help,' Ariel said. "'In fact, I've brought this planet pretty much under control without your wisdom and guidance. All I need from you now is your muscle, that part between your ears.' "'You didn't answer my question.' "'Your internal monitor link of the robot cities. I'll bet you didn't know that it modulates hyperwave.' "'Au contraire, my dear.' Derek said. That is a form of communication that depends on a special understanding of space-time physics developed by my ever-so-centric father, the good old Dr. Avery. And au contraire right back at you, smarty. That is what the aliens on this planet, the Ceramians, refer to as continuous modulation of hyperwave. Ask Avernus and Chemo, and Jacob too. He even understands it. It's the communication version of key teleportation. Just like conventional discrete modulation of hyperwave is the communication version of hyperjump technology. I bet you didn't even recognize that. They'd been together for all of ten minutes, and already they were going at it hammer and tongs. So this is what love is all about? Derek asked himself. I'll have to think about that, he said. Was it possible she was right? He changed the subject. Now what about the crisis? The reason for me being here? There is no crisis, except that I had to get you here promptly to avoid one. She told him then how the robot city disturbed the weather, how the Meustrians had kept and controlled the disturbance of the dome, how they were ready to close it completely until she came up with her plan of a plant, planet-wide farm, abandoning the idea of a planet-wide city. So you see, she concluded, your task is straightforward and reasonably simple. Just reprogram the Averys into farmers. I presume this is another example of your style of engineering, Derek said. Not bad, huh? Social engineering, Derek. Something you wouldn't understand. There is just one minor problem. He paused. Ariel said, And that is... In order to program the Averys to pursue a particular technology, one must know something about that technology. I know all about cities. I don't know the first thing about farms, and I suspect you don't either. Woolruff came into the compartment in time to hear Derek's last sentence. She took the passenger seat next to Silverside. Ariel looked stunned. That seems to be a piece of engineering she doesn't have covered, Derek thought. Perhaps there is more to engineering than meets her eye. He was feeling smug and complacent. The bit about continuous modulation of hyperwave had thrown him for a moment, but now he felt he was back in control of the expedition. "'So you don't know the first thing about farms, Derek?' "'So what?' Wolruff said. "'I seem to have come in in the middle of the show.' "'So you can't reprogram the Avery robots to be farmers,' Derek said, "'if you don't know anything about farming and farming technology.' "'Have no fear. Wolruff is here,' the small furry alien said. "'And I was raised on a farm and educated at Agribolitech. "'I am your original acid engineer.' "'Okay, Derek, what do you say now?' Ariel said. "'You think I didn't know that? Where have you been all this time?' Derek ignored Ariel. "'You, a farmer?' He was looking at Bullruff. "'What products do you think you're any but from my family?' Bullruff asked. "'The Yurani are not all pirates like our enemies. They're mostly traders, and they live on an impoverished bowl of rock to cruise regions better than it does tomatoes.' In these days of overpopulation, the Urani survive on the grain and farm products they buy from us. And there was Ariel, glowing now, when she had been shocked half out of her doors before Ariel Bullruff put in her two cents. She had had no more idea than he that Woolruff was a farmer. But Derek was quick to regroup, and he was now admitting to himself that Woolruff's contribution might well amount to more than two cents, galactic money standard. Okay, I'll submit. I'll handle the computer technology. 
Bull Ruff will handle the farm technology, and you can continue to handle the social technology. Not entirely, Ariel said. You could tell she was about to reveal something that was not entirely easy to divulge. You must meet with me and the aliens tomorrow morning. And it looks as though Woolruff will also need to attend that meeting, as our farm specialist. For what purpose? Derek asked. They want to develop a schedule. The Cerebrons are anxious to return to their nomadic life, from which they've been diverted by the problem of our city. They've been camping out in the forest of repose, as they call it. The woods next to the city. Ariel looked at her watch. You may want to watch this, she said. It's sort of spectacular. We can watch the show from the lorry as we drive into the city. We need to be getting back anyway. It's almost time for dinner. Jacob and Mandelbrot were standing near the lorry as Derek and Ariel started down the ramp. The robots had already loaded Derek's gear into the lorry. Derek called, I want you to drive, Mandelbrot. He wanted to stand by the driver so as to watch better whatever show it was that Ariel had scheduled for them, and he darn well didn't want that muscle-bought Jacob standing beside him, upstaging him, so to speak, in front of the audience sitting behind. He glanced at Ariel, daring her to challenge his decision. She looked at him quizzically, but then gave him a quirky little smile that, and didn't say anything, and that was as infuriating as if she'd questioned his order. She knew exactly why he wanted Mandelbrot to di drive, Somehow he always displayed his buttons, and Ariel knew exactly which ones to push. But the show was every bit as spectacular as she had intimated. She stood up to point out the one she thought was the Cerebron leader, Sinapo, circling high over the dome, and it was he who dropped first, a tiny black ball plummeting toward the forest like a lead shot, becoming a small bomb, trailing a shiny smoke that slowly expanded into a silver ball that drifted gently down into the treetops, and then bobbed up to rest on the top of the forest like a ball of mercury on a countertop. That was a solo performance, and then, from near Sinapo's flight circle, another followed. Sarko, the leader of the Muestria, Ariel guessed. Then after a time, over the space of a quarter hour, they all dropped until they were dispersed like myriad beads of silvery moisture, over the surface of the green foliage. Chapter 17 The Cerebot The Provisional Laws of Humanix 1. A human being may not injure another human being, or through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. 2. A human being must give only reasonable orders to a robot, and require nothing of it that would needlessly put it into the kind of dilemma that might cause it harm or discomfort. 3. A human being must not harm a robot, or, through an action, allow a robot to come to harm, unless such harm is needed to keep a human being from harm, or to allow a vital order to be carried out. From Central Computer File, Humanix, Mechanical Access, Drawer 667, Bin eight two, keyword access humans, subkey laws, file creator Rydberg one. The next morning, well before ten o'clock, Mandelbrot parked the lorry near the west edge of the dome opening, and the three mammals got out, instructing the three robots to stay behind in the lorry, but to record everything that transpired once the aliens arrived. "'Well, friend Mandelbrot, it is some time since we've been able to talk privately,' Jacob Winterson said. "'That will hardly be the case with the wild one present,' Mandelbrot said. "'What would you say in what you do? It is completely unpredictable. It deactivated me on the wolf planet.' Jacob and Mandelbrot were still standing behind the control panel of the lorry. Silverside was sitting on the back seat that she had occupied before Ruff on the way to the meeting site. "'For your information,' Silverside said, "'I am not an it. "'I am currently at the female persuasion, "'having imprinted on Woolruff. "'You may refer to me for the pronouns "'she and her, Jacob, "'and you need not think that I will deactivate "'either of you now that I know "'that Mistress Woolruff would not react kindly "'to that action. "'Further, I am completely unaffected "'by what you may say or do, "'now that I understand that Miss Woolruff "'wants me to modulate the third law slightly to accord you some modest protection. 
So, friend Jacob, Mend Butt said, have you pondered further upon that imponderable the laws of humanics? Yes, I have, Jacob replied, and I find them woefully inadequate in describing human behavior. Rydberg and his companions are inexperienced in dealing with humans, who are an unfathomable lot. Emotions, not laws, govern their behavior. And I think perhaps the female of the species is the most mysterious of all. I've been researching the emotion of jealousy since I seem to have acquired essentially been acquired essentially to create that emotion in the breast of Master Derrick. I hardly think emotion can reside in the breast of a human, friend Jacob, Mendelblatt suggested. Merely a figure of speech used in the literature of the subject, Jacob replied. The key point of interest here, however, is the multiplicity of shades and overtones that exist in the minds of humans in their consideration of the opposite sex. Shades and overtones of emotion that apparently have nothing to do with reproductions of the species. Yes, the tenable reason for there being the two sexes in the first place. Surprisingly, Silverside was becoming interested in the conversation after all. She agreed with Jacob's assessment that any laws of humanics would guide human behavior and supposedly parallel the laws of robotics that guided her behavior. And now the subject of their conversation seemed to bear directly on her discomfort with the femininity of the woolruff imprint, and this seemed paradoxically to be aggravated by the keen interest in everything feminine she had felt earlier in the masculine mode while imprinted on Derek. It was a discomfort that came from an awareness of her own narcissism, something she had never experienced before, but was at once both fascinating and repulsive. She concluded that she was attracted to feminine beings, but would rather it not her own being. But what was the cause for the attraction? She concluded it must stem from that first powerful imprint on Kenai that had not been altogether dispelled by her preference for the Derek imprint, the male imprint. That comfort of a masculine imprint was only a little less powerful than the laws that were intended to govern her behavior, but which she found so difficult to interpret for want of knowing what a human was. She could deprogram neither those laws nor her feelings of masculinity, nor that insidious attraction for all that was feminine. She found that she was experiencing another form of discomfort that came from listening to Jacob and Mandelbrot. She had never before heard two robots conversing with one another. The discomfort came not from that process, but, again, from their words, what she deduced from their words. They were talking as though they knew what a human was, and she, Silverside, was still exploring that subject by the process of multiple imprints, trying to progress to ever higher levels of intelligence, for surely only the most intelligent species in the galaxy could be the humans she was seeking. "'Jacob, you talk about uh, the laws of humanics as though you know what a human is,' she said. "'Certainly,' Jacob said. "'I am so programmed. How else could I implant the laws of humanics?' "'Am I a human?' she asked. "'No, you're a robot,' Jacob replied. "'How do you know?' "'Mr. Derrick says so. Further, my own senses tend to support his contention. You're not a mammal.' "'What about Mr. Swulruff? Is she human?' No, but she is a mammal. True, but not all mammals are humans. What is a human, Jacob? Silverside asked. There are many definitions, some very complicated, some very simple. We are generally programmed with only one. What is an example of a simple definition? Accent and speaking standard. Most humans speak standard, so a simple definition for a special set of robots on a planet called Solaria once used the Solarian accent to find humans. A very simple test, not requiring any unusual instrumentation. And how do you define the human, Jacob? By the number of their chromosomes and the configuration of their X and Y chromosomes. And how do you determine that information? With an instrument. A cellular nanomachine built into my right index finger. You don't make the determination each time you meet that same human, do you? No, once I determine that being is a human, I put its image into a pattern recognition table. Further, I am inclined to accept as human any being that approximate an average of those images, without the chromosome tests. Mistress Ariel and Master Derek are both humans, then? Yes. 
And which do you feel more compelled to protect? My immediate master, Mr. Ariel. And you, Mandelbrot, which would you favor? Master Derrick, though the choice would be difficult, Mandelbrot said. And what about Wurruf? Silverside asked. Would you protect her, Mandelbrot? Yes, for my friend Jacob and I are both programmed to treat her as human. Don't you find that strange? A being is... Thoughts of Wolroth as a human were shunted aside by the landing at the meeting site of black demonic beings, two of them who, simultaneously stalled out of perfect choreography, breaking with their wings right spread, seeming to shut off the sun in the enveloping blackness of their presence. Then they touched down lightly, folded rustling wings close in, in to their bodies, shrinking to the size of the mammals they faced and became black silhouettes, surmounted by wicked-looking snow-white hooks above burning red eyes. The impenetrable soft blackness that shrouded their physical essence in mystery projected a disquieting impression of latent power. Silverside concentrated on recording everything that transpired. She thought that she was possibly observing the ultimate form of humanity, the final objective in a frustrating quest. "'Good morning, leaders of the Ceremians,' Ariel said. "'This is Wolruff and this is Derek, both members of our reprogramming task force. "'Wolruff, Derek, I would like you to meet Sinapo, leader of the Cerebrons.' "'The alien on the right expanded slightly with the rustling sound of a bat's wings, "'amplified by an order of magnitude. "'And Sarko, the leader of the Meustria. "'The alien on the left expanded, rustling. "'Derek spoke next.' My colleague, Wolrof and I, are honored that you will be working with us to produce an environment on your planet of benefit to both our peoples. That is to be desired, the alien Sinarpo said with a strange accent, more pronounced than Wolrof's, which made understanding the alien even more difficult. But first, Derek continued, would you explain the nature of the dome and the method of its construction so that we may determine how best to modify the city within to be as innocuous as possible? The node compensator is a localized separation of space and time, Sarko said. He said nothing further, as though that fully explained it. Yes, go on, Derek said. That's it, a localized rift in space-time, Sarko said with a mild disdain, as though he were lecturing a backward student. A locus of points in the cosmos where our universe no longer exists. And how do you create such a rift? Do you understand what I mean by a rift in the cosmos? Derek hesitated. Not entirely, he said. Then you're not likely to understand how such a rift is created, and we should move on to a more profitable subject for discussion. Sinapo entered the discussion at that point. The rift is created and enlarged by the intense application of electrons, which themselves are convolutions in space-time. The stream of electrons, highly focused on a microscopic volume at the initial point of separation, enlarges the void progressively around the extent of the rift, much as I separate the cores of my reflector when I untether each morning. But as my colleague Sarko suggests, perhaps we should move directly to a discussion of your schedule for implanting harmonious gravitation. Strictly from visual observations, the dome seems to partake the nature of a black hole, Derek persisted. Is that what you're saying? Black hole? Sinapo said, as though now having difficulty himself to turn to the conversation. Black hole, yes, that's a good analogy. The derivation of the world was not self evident. Yes, the compensator is a black hole, but an unnatural one internal to the universe, not on the edge. A black hole is a concavity, not as a convexity at the edge where space and time separate in the course of the natural decay of the universe. Now may we move on? Just uh, two more questions, Derek said. When we look at the dome from the outside, we can't see the city. We see objects on the other side as though the dome and the city weren't there. Why can't we see the city inside? The compensator's intense curvature of space-time bends the light around the dome, much as light from a distant star is bent slightly as it goes around our sun. In the case of the compensator, the bending is not slight. It is calculated to produce the effect of invisibility and non-existence. One of its attributes is a compensator. You had one more question? 
Uh, yes. Why should hyperspace fire, fire fall toward the surface of the black concavity and escape only by the full thrust of its impulse engines? As Ariel described to me last night, an effect of the curvature of space-time, when the atmosphere, the air inside the dome, uh, does not fall in t toward the blackness likewise? You answered your own question, Sinapo said. A small green flame hissed from the blackness of a decimeter below his eyes, and his voice took on a note of irritation, as though his patience were about to be exhausted. The curvature of space-time, as you suggested, the fire was beyond the neutral cell in the gravitational field of the black concavity. The planet's atmosphere is in the neutral shell in the gravitational field of the planet. With a note of finality, Sinapo concluded with a question. Did your jumper not have to achieve normal escape velocity to drive into the blackness before it could reverse and try to escape back to the planet? Quickly, before Derek had time to fully digest those last remarks, Ariel regained control of the meeting. With firmness, she said, Now, Honorable Sermians, our schedule calls for the first phase of our effort to be completed in two months. That effort will provide sufficient farm area and production. One thousand square kilometers for proof of environmental passivity. Concurrently, we will modify the city to provide terminal facilities for local and interstellar transport vehicles. Those facilities will project through the opening in the dome, but will be insulated and force ventilated to ensure that all harmful radiation and emissions will be retained within the dome. Woolruff, our farm engineer specialist, and Derek, our city engineering specialist, will now describe the detailed schedules for those two activities. Silverside recorded all that, but her attention, her whole being, was concentrated on the alien Sinapo. His domination of the dialogue told her that he was the superior of the two aliens, and potentially more powerful, more intelligent, than any of the mammals she'd become familiar with. In short, she had found the ultimate target for her final imprint, or so she believed. She left off recording the meeting with the aliens. She had found a new rule model to fit the beings the laws of robotics compelled her to serve. She was no longer obligated to observe the orders of lesser beings. Still, she gave Wolf a last thought filled with fondness, that new emotion she had found in her consideration of life crier, now far, far away. She would continue to protect Woolruff with just a little less weight than she gave herself under the third law, the law of self-preservation. She turned her attention back to the alien on the right, Sinapo, and concentrated now on the technical details of the imprint, particularly the aerodynamic characteristics that would be the hardest to duplicate. The calculations quickly showed that her wing spread and the air foil area would have to be several fold greater than that of the aliens in order to support her body weight. Their body mass must be light indeed, with the mostly hollow structural reinforcements, and she'd have to increase the dimensions of her body to provide the geometry needed for the wing connections and the leverage required for the wing manipulators. Not surprisingly, that was going to decrease her body density to match that of the aliens. She worked on the eyes next. They were compound, radiating red and infrared. The radiation came from a ring that surrounded the conventional animal optic in the center and provided controlled illumination for viewing objects when the sun's radiation was blocked by the planet. Then she turned her attention to the black body surface and found that to be more of a problem than the aerodynamics and the optics. She experimented on her arm as she sat in the back seat of the lorry, but finally had to give up and settle for a blackish gray with a soft silvery luster just as she had finally given up on matching the details of hair and skin coloring of the mammals. Next, she attacked the source and nature, the nature of the green flame that had burst from the alien, Sinapo. She had the feeling that it was a tool, if not a weapon, that was required to provide a satisfactory imprint. She designed a small electrolytic cell compressor and high-pressure storage containers for hydrogen and oxygen in a release orifice at the rear of her oral cavity, but she kept her conventional speakers for communication, and she added a small factory to fix nitrogen in the form of ammonia to provide the trace of that compound that gave the flame its green color. 
All during that period of analyzing the alien Snapo, she was absorbing the powerful masculinity he radiated, intercepting and recording the red glare of his eyes, sweeping up his physical essence, the body language, the subtle mannerisms that escaped that otherwise all-absorbing black silhouette. Finally, she was ready, and she said to the organometallic cells of her body, and their pseudo dory bosoms to the task of alterating her genetic tapes her robotic dna her equivalents of messenger and transfer and ribosomal rna and the myriad other factors contained in her multi-billion microbiotic cells that would finally contain in her multi-billion microbiotic cells that would finally affect the alien imprint as her form changed she stepped up to stand on the back seat of the open lorry to give her forelegs room to develop wings, and then, as her long hind legs shorted and thickened, she braced them against the back of the seat to, s to steady herself. With their attention on the meeting, the two robots in the front of the lorry did not observe the transformation, nor did the mammals in the meeting who faced away from her. She was under observation only by the aliens, and they did not seem to notice or care. Finally, the transformation was complete save for the hook in its tether, that she had programmed last because of its difficult, different matrix, a stainless form of shining steel configured in a hollow, curved horn, and a fine-stranded but sturdy, flexible cable. She hoped to fly, but she had abandoned the balloon and the act of ballooning she had witnessed the evening before. The hook, then, was purely for effect. Comfortably masculine now, Silverside was standing on the back seat of the lorry, fully erect, three meters high, with his wings folded tightly against his body, as though he just emerged from a cocoon like a newly metamorphosed butterfly. He felt the need to open and exercise them, to get the feel of them, and with that he recalled, called flying in bird form on the wolf planet. The mammals and the aliens were still absorbed in their meeting. The aliens apparently thought the growing silver side was a natural phenomenon associated with the lorry, for they gave no sign of looking directly in silver side's direction. Slowly he opened his wings. The thin, tough, organometallic membrane rustled faintly as he unfolded the airfoil to its full twenty-five meters. He found then that he could not avoid measuring air currents. He had not been aware of even a faint breezes. He had stood there on the back seat with his wings folded, but now he felt the gentle pressure acting on his wings, pressing his simulated feathery cold junction against the back of the seat. He resisted the torque that was endeavoring to tumble him out of the back of the lorry, only with a distinct effort by digging his toes into the seat cushion. The effort was more than he cared to maintain, so he folded his wings back against his body, reducing the wind area. Then he turned, walked across the seat to the side of the lorry, hesitated, looking at Woolruff who was running toward him and shouting his name, and then spread his wings again and hopped over the side. He felt the glorious sensation of flight, of being airborne as he gently glided to the ground. When his feet touched he fell flat on his face, his wings outspread with a feel of slow motion that began with his dragging toes digging shallow furrows in the dust next to the roadway. With difficulty he got up, using his wings to lever himself erect before folding them into his body, and then Woolruff was on him, hind legs straddling his back and pinning his wings to his side, hands grasping his hook to keep her purchase, and Derek was winding a rope around both him and Woolruff, binding them together. Okay. That was a bit of a weird chapter. Very, very, very weird. Weird chapter. I hope you all enjoyed. And have a good day. Bye!